Welcome to josephsmithspolygamy.org, the audio version. John C. Bennett's Short Stay in Nauvoo John C. Bennett arrived in Nauvoo in September of 1840 and stayed less than two years. In spite of his relatively brief time living among the saints, his impact upon the secret expansion of plural marriage was immense. Upon his arrival, Bennett roomed with the Smith family for 39 weeks, for which he was charged $3 a week. That he and Joseph experienced many personal conversations at that time is likely, given the small size of the Smith home where he boarded. Plural marriage would not necessarily have been discussed due to Emma's resistance to the practice. In late November 1840, Bennett visited the Illinois state capitol to lobby for the Nauvoo Charter. Thomas Ford, Illinois governor from 1842 to 1846, remembered, Bennett managed matters well for his constituents. He flattered both sides with the hope of Mormon favor. The vote was taken, the A's and no's were not called for, no one opposed it, but all were busy and active in hurrying it through. Bennett was rewarded for his efforts at the state capitol by being elected mayor of Nauvoo on February 1, 1841. Despite Bennett's talents and charisma, he was morally challenged. His pre-Nauvoo reputation included several vices, including sexual immorality. Within months of his move to Illinois, Joseph Smith heard rumors of his tainted past. By mid-February 1841, the prophet sent George Miller to McConnellsville, Ohio, to investigate. Four weeks later, Miller reported back that Bennett, who had been passing himself off as a bachelor, was already married and... His poor but confiding wife followed him from place to place, with no suspicion of his unfaithfulness to her. At length, however, he became so bold in his departures that it was evident to all around that he was a sore offender, and his wife left him under satisfactory evidence of his adulterous connections, nor was this his only fault. He used her bad otherwise." At one point in their marriage, when Bennett was accused of adultery and breaking up another wedded couple, his wife reportedly declared that if he succeeded in separating the pair, that it would be the seventh family that he had parted during their union. While Bennett was baptized and professed a belief in the restored gospel, it appears that he did not change his previous adulterous lifestyle, but within months of his arrival in Nauvoo and unbeknown to the prophet, he continued his secret attempts to seduce women. Even though leaders were aware of Bennett's licentious history, his public stature expanded, and on April 8, 1841, he was presented as an assistant president until President Reagan's health should be restored, which occurred two months later. It appears that this surprising advancement was the result of Bennett's immoral antics being privately discovered, and then after promising to reform and receiving another chance to regain Joseph's trust. Whatever early repentance Bennett may have initially manifest, his actions show that he did not follow through. In May of 1841, he approached church member Catherine Fuller privately with a straightforward proposition of sex only a week after they first met. On May 25, 1842, she testified that Bennett seduced me. Nearly a year ago, I became acquainted with John C. Bennett after visiting twice, and on the third time, he proposed unlawful intercourse, being about one week after first acquaintance. He said he wished his desires granted. I told him it was contrary to my feelings. He assured me there was others in higher standing than I was who would conduct in that way, and there was no harm in it. He said there should be no sin upon me. If there was any sin, it should come upon himself. John C. Bennett was the first man that seduced me. No man ever made that attempt before him. Whether Joseph Smith was aware of this seduction is unknown. However, Bennett's immoralities apparently had reached the prophet's ears weeks later. In 1842, L.D. Wasson, Emma Smith's nephew, wrote to him, I was reading in your, Joseph Smith's chamber, last summer, 1841. Yourself and Bennett came into the lower room. 
and I heard you give J.C. Bennett a tremendous flagellation for practicing iniquity under the base pretense of authority from the heads of the church. If you recollect, I came down just before you were through talking. Joseph later complained, The only sin I ever committed was in exercising sympathy and covering up their, John C. Bennett and others, iniquities on their solemn promise to reform, and of this I am ashamed and will never do so again. It is evident that Joseph Smith kept Bennett out of his private circles throughout 1841 and 1842, While Bennett received several lofty titles, including general in the Nauvoo Legion, he seldom, if ever, met in private council with Joseph Smith or other church leaders. Meetings were held by members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve many times in the months immediately after the Twelve's July 1841 return from England, but Bennett was not invited to any of those gatherings. Biographer Andrew F. Smith concluded that, Despite the importance of his position, Bennett appears to have officiated at few public religious activities. He occasionally preached, and as mayor of Nauvoo, he performed a few civil marriage ceremonies. He did serve as President Pro Tem in a special conference held on April 6, 1842, but otherwise he played little role in church conferences. Bennett's improprieties apparently did not diminish despite his pledges to reform. In May of 1842, he was examined by the municipal court where he confessed he said he had seduced six or seven women in the city and said if he was forgiven, he would not be guilty anymore. The patience of the prophet and other leaders had run out and Bennett was disfellowshipped. Whether out of embarrassment or a desire for revenge for his public humiliation, he resigned as mayor on May 19, leaving the city weeks later. During Bennett's 22-month stay in Nauvoo, he experienced a meteoric rise in power that was matched in speed only by his fall from grace, which was primarily due to his womanizing behaviors. Had John C. Bennett quietly exited Nauvoo, leaving the flurry of accusations to fade through the passage of time, the remainder of Joseph Smith's life might have been dramatically altered. Bennett, however, was not inclined to walk away from a fight. In addition, he was intelligent and gifted in many areas, with established ties to publishers and politicians in the East. Months later, he wrote, He, Joseph Smith, has awakened the wrong passenger and must suffer. John C. Bennett commanded a formidable armada of personal resources and was willing to recruit them to combat his new enemy, Joseph Smith. His first onslaught consisted of six letters to the Sangamo Journal in Springfield, Illinois, penned between July 8 and August 19, which were complete with multiple salvos to defame Joseph Smith. In late October, Bennett fired his next round by publishing an expose titled The History of the Saints. Andrew F. Smith assessed, Although the book was almost 350 pages, four-fifths consisted of material previously written. This included Bennett's previously published newspaper articles, personal letters, and testimonials. Bennett's major contributions were to organize and determine the contents and to promote and advertise the book. Bennett's depiction in his publications of the practice and teachings of polygamy in Nauvoo were remarkable, even over the top. The weaknesses were not lost on anti-Mormon authors. T. B. H. Stenhouse cautioned, There is no doubt much truth in Bennett's book. But no statement that he makes can be received with confidence. Illinois historian Theodore Calvin Pease concurred, Undoubtedly, Bennett was able to tell many things regarding the aims, methods, and morals of the Mormon leaders, but his exposures appeared unreliable. 
Bennett's reputation was also a problem. Antagonist Anne Eliza Young wrote, It is probable that the book would have had a much wider influence had not Bennett's character been so well known. He was a notorious profiglet and was pronounced by Gentiles who had known him before he embraced Mormonism to be the greatest villain unhung. Von Brody admitted to any discerning reader, Bennett revealed himself in his own book to be a base and ignoble opportunist. Joseph Smith tried to neutralize John C. Bennett's charges in several ways, including plain denials. Missionaries were also dispatched specifically to counteract his claims against the church. Henry William Bigler recalled, In the month of August, 1842, at a special conference, a goodly number of elders were called to go on missions and to rebuke John Bennett's lies among the number I was called. In addition, the prophet commissioned the publication of Affidavits and Certificates, disproving the statements and affidavits contained in John C. Bennett's letters, Nauvoo, Illinois, August 31, 1842. This single double-sided sheet contained 13 affidavits and other communications designed to undermine Bennett's credibility and counter his claims. Was Bennett a polygamy confidant of Joseph Smith? During the past decades, numerous authors have composed their reconstructions of Nauvoo polygamy, writing as if John C. Bennett were a personal confidant of Joseph Smith, possessing a first-hand knowledge of plural marriage. Antagonists often quote Bennett as if he was a polygamy insider because his published declarations invariably portray Joseph Smith as a womanizer and hypocrite. For example, Bennett was the only person to accuse Joseph Smith of premarriage physical affection. When writing about Joseph's proposal to Nancy Rigdon, Bennett alleged he, Joseph Smith, then attempted to kiss her, Nancy Rigdon, and desired her to kiss him. Similarly, when writing of the prophet and Sarah Pratt, Bennett also asserted that Joseph Smith stealthily approached and kissed her. Sarah never corroborated this claim, despite having many opportunities to do so and many allegations of her own to make. It has been argued that Bennett's temporary position in the church hierarchy would have made it essentially impossible. It has been argued that Bennett's temporary position in the church hierarchy would have made it essentially impossible for Joseph Smith to have kept him ignorant of plural marriage. But the prophet successfully kept his own brother, associate church president and church patriarch Hiram Smith, unaware of the principle until mid-1843, nearly a full year after Bennett was cut off. Similarly, William Law, set apart as a counselor in the First Presidency on January 19, 1841, months prior to Bennett's calling, reported that he didn't learn of plural marriage until 1843. If Joseph Smith had desired to keep John C. Bennett out of the loop through July of 1842, he could have successfully done so. Without question, John C. Bennett was physicianed to hear rumors of Joseph Smith's teachings and practices. Evidence that Bennett had never learned of plural marriage from Joseph Smith is apparent when comparing the teachings of the two men. In his writings, John C. Bennett consistently referred to polygamy as spiritual wifery, a term used by other religionists. The prophet described plural marriage as the new and everlasting covenant of marriage and as an order of the priesthood and never as spiritual wifery. The revelation on celestial and plural marriage dictated by Joseph Smith, now section 132, contains no mention of the words spiritual or wifery. Also, Bennett did not adopt terms like everlasting wifery, celestial wifery, eternal wifery, or spiritual marriage, which would have incorporated the language used in the Revelation. Bennett's terminology was straightforward. Spiritual wifery needed no ceremony, but created spiritual wives who could have sex with men who became their spiritual husbands so long as they kept the union a secret. The spiritual wifehood and spiritual husbandhood meant nothing after a liaison unless the couple decided to recreate their secret sexual union at some future time. 
In contrast, Joseph Smith taught that celestial marriage was a restoration of Old Testament polygamy like that practiced by Abraham and Jacob. Bennett's spiritual wifery would have been considered adultery under Old Testament standards. In his book, History of the Saints, he divided participating females into three different orders, with participants wearing different colored veils. However, no such polygamy orders or veils were described in Joseph Smith's plural marriage theology. Additional observations help assess John C. Bennett's actual proximity to Joseph Smith and his private plural marriage teachings. One important clue is found in an October 28, 1843 letter that he wrote to the Iowa Hawkeye. According to promise, I now address you a few lines in relation to the new doctrine of marrying for eternity, lately gotten up by the Holy Joe for the benefit of his flock. Joe says that as they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven in eternity, it has been revealed to him that there will be no harmony in heaven unless the saints select their companions and marry in time for eternity. They must marry in time so as to begin to form that sincere attachment and unsophisticated affection which it is so necessary to consummate in eternity in order to have the peace of heaven. So Joe Smith has lately been married to his present wife, Emma, for eternity as well as for time. This marrying for eternity is not the spiritual wife doctrine noticed in my expose, The History of the Saints, but it is an entirely new doctrine established by special revelation, the spiritual wives for time and the celestial wives for eternity. Here Bennett reports that this marrying for eternity is not the spiritual wife doctrine, but is an entirely new doctrine established by special revelation. William Law recalled that J.C. Bennett declared to me before God that Joseph Smith had never taught him such doctrines of spiritual wifery, and that he never told anyone that he, Joseph Smith, had taught any such things, and that anyone who said so told base lies. John C. Bennett's biographer, Andrew F. Smith, concluded that no primary evidence has been presented indicating that Bennett was officially involved in the evolving practice of polygamy at Nauvoo. No evidence indicates that Bennett's extramarital relationships were sanctioned by Joseph Smith. If Bennett was not a polygamy insider, it becomes more difficult to believe that he would have experienced multiple confidential conversations as he claimed in his publications concerning the prophet's plural marriage interactions with women like Nancy Rigdon and Sarah Pratt, that he would have been a first-hand witness and even a private accomplice in activities involving Joseph's secretly expanding polygamy is also problematic. His accusations against Joseph Smith could not be based upon first-hand knowledge, Clearly, Bennett was positioned to hear rumors about polygamy and the identities of plural wives. However, his apparent distance from the nucleus of Nauvoo polygamy is obvious in his writings and accusations. Nauvoo Plural Marriage by the End of 1842 By the end of Bennett's stay in Nauvoo in July 1842, the prophet had been sealed to perhaps 12 women, most of them in eternity-only sealings. In addition, Three other men married plural wives during the year. Heber C. Kimball and Brigham Young were sealed to one polygamous wife each, and sometime before his July 31, 1842 death, Vincent Knight also married a plural spouse. To read more about the practice of polygamy in The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, check out Joseph Smith's Polygamy Toward a Better Understanding.